Good morning, everyone. I'm Carl Rochelle. I'm the CEO and founder of System76. I'm with Jeremy Soller, uh, engineering manager at System76. Uh, if you don't know about us, um, we are a Linux computer OEM. We, uh, we specialize in laptops, desktops, and servers. We've been doing this for about 14 years now. And 14 years ago, when we started this, every single thing you could imagine about making a Linux laptop was challenging. The touchpads didn't work, the hotkeys didn't work, the graphics didn't work, the modems, uh, Ethernet. We, our first laptops had 56K baud modems. Uh, those were a nightmare. But it was our, our ethos that if you're going to build a product, then all the things on that product needed to work. So we spent lots of time building or, or working on just the fundamental functionality of laptops. Um, there were binary blobs everywhere throughout the stack, but that was necessary just to get these the, the devices working as they should. Now, over the course of the last 14 years, that's changed dramatically. A lot of those binary blobs have been replaced by open source software. The effort to bring a laptop up is far less than what it was 14 years ago. Uh, now the things that we're working on aren't just getting to par functionality with the proprietary world, it's going beyond what exists in the proprietary world. We're working on things like uh, pr uh, improving uh, boot performance, improving the uh, reliability for spend, uh, overall performance of the machine and with things like um, uh, more precise fan curves and, and other effort to not just, not just match what's happening in the proprietary world, but go beyond it. Now, it was always our ambition to offer open source firmware as well, Core Boot or, or Linux Boot or any of those projects along the way. The challenge that we had was that uh, to reverse engineer the proprietary firmware that we received and get it to the point where it was operating with the same functionality with Core Boot would take a few months. And a few months isn't enough time for us to deliver hardware on day zero. And for us, day zero means that when Intel releases the chip, when NVIDIA releases the GPU, our customers have access to that hardware at the same time that everyone else in the hardware world has access to that. So we couldn't have this gap of time between, between when we're ready to release and we have the Linux stack ready to go, um, but we don't have a firmware stack ready to go. We felt like what we needed to, to bridge that gap between, between the proprietary firmware and being able to ship it and open source firmware was help and, and a partnership with silicon providers. We needed, we needed the assistance and, the, uh, and access to the type of documentation and reference boards that are available from Intel and AMD and other suppliers. So um, then come along about November of 2018, uh, Intel sends us an email and they say, Hey, we're looking for a partner to build open firmware. We need a, uh, we're looking for a, 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 a preferably a company that specializes in Linux, uh, a company that uh, can deliver hardware on production hardware without boot guard. That way, the the hardware itself is is hackable on firmware. Uh, so uh, uh, so we said, well, yeah, we're absolutely interested in that. A few months later, Intel and their team came out. I'll tell you, there's something unique. Uh, when this team came out to meet us. You see, we, we talked to Intel, let's see, bi-weekly. We have bi-weekly meetings. Uh, AMD comes out about once a month or so. Uh, Samsung, all of our vendors come out and meet with us pretty regularly. But these are folks that are within the sales channel. And so they're coming out to show us the roadmap, what's coming. Uh, so it helps us keep on top of uh, and uh, plan out what our product's life cycle is going to be. But the firmware team that came from Intel were engineers. And it was clear to us pretty early that, that this isn't about them telling us things to, you know, that, that we should be using to make. This was, uh, these were people that we could build something with. Uh, and that's an encouraging, uh, uh, that's an encouraging distinction uh, with, with this, uh, this partnership. So, uh, so we had hardware that was available uh, uh, on the market. We could disable boot guard. Now it was, uh, uh, now it was Intel coming in and, and wanting to discuss uh, what project that they had in mind. And it was, uh, it was a project called Min Platform. Min Platform was, I, th I believe, I think they would say it better, they, they're talking a little later today, but it was an experiment to determine um, what the minimum amount of code that's necessary to bring up an x86 system. 
So they started their presentation. It was a snowy day out. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of snow coming down, and the presentation was continuing. It went on for an hour, and then two hours, and then three hours, and then six hours later, we decided we better take a break because it was snowing too hard, and we had to send everybody home. So uh, so we sent everybody home. We had to actually close up the factory, and then uh, uh, and then come back the next morning. So the guys came back. We got back to our cramped room. We only have one small, really private room at our factory and and so we got into that cramped room and it gets really hot in there and so so six hours is it was quite a presentation uh so then we had about two more hours of presentation and afterwards the intel guys um, say so this is what we're trying to do would you partner with us on building open firmware and we said you had us at open firmware <laughs> <laughs> we, this is absolutely um, what we've been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, we, we felt that, that, like I said, the, the challenge for us was we were day zero AM. We didn't feel like the Linux desktop should, be, should lag behind everyone else. When Intel had a new CPU, when AMD has a new CPU, we wanted to be there at the exact same time. And over the course of the last 14 years, we've done quite well at being able to do that. Now, with the, uh, with the support of Intel and, and um, us partnering on building firmware, um, we feel really confident that once we finish our first open firmware product, um, now the thing is, once you do that first one, you can't go back. That means we've built, we're going to build a laptop that ships with open firmware. The next version of that laptop can't ship with proprietary firmware for three months before we ship the open firmware for it. We want to ship on Day Zero the same way, so that's the complete product. Uh, so that's what uh, that's the path that we're working towards. Uh, so now I'm going to hand the stage to Jeremy. Uh, he's going to talk you through the steps that we took going from a proprietary BIOS on, on hardware, on this specific hardware, and moving to open firmware. Yeah, so in order to meet the demand of having absolutely new hardware and delivering it with open firmware, we have to come up with a process that lets us develop the firmware in a very short period of time. So what we took as our target system was actually this system here, the Darter Pro. It's running Core Boot right now, and it's running Tiana Core, and it's booting Pop OS, which is our operating system project. The first thing you have to do is not be afraid to flash the system. You're going to flash bad firmware. It's not going to boot. That's absolutely the case. Only one time out of the, out of the six different models I've done have I ever had the first <laughs> definition of things be correct and the system actually get to graphics in it with the first firmware I flashed. So what we use is this tool here. This is a Raspberry Pi with a spy clip on it. It clips onto the motherboard to a chip on the motherboard that holds the firmware. And it replaces it with a good image, with a bad image, with complete garbage, whatever. Uh, and the benefit of having this device is we're no longer afraid. So we can start developing firmware, flash a bad image, get it working again, and keep moving. So the first thing that we do when we have this confidence is get documentation. And the documentation often looks a little bit like this. Uh, oops, I have to type a password because it's password protected. And you'll <laughs> notice confidential written in watermark. I can't even show you this page. So everything in documentation about embedded controllers, Intel PCH, things like that are often confidential, which is a big problem in this community. Now, thankfully, the Intel documentation does open up after product launch sometimes. But, <laughs> but when you get that documentation, you can now start working on support in the firmware. So a lot of the devices that are in, are, and I say devices inside of this device, I'm talking about disks, I'm talking about the graphics, I'm talking about uh, the, the spy ROM, I'm talking about camera. They are all supported either by firmware, custom code for the firmware, or industry standard drivers. So when you talk about things like disks, they have industry standard drivers. There's no work you have to do there. You have an NVMe driver. It works across every board. But when you talk about things like PCHs, when you talk about the GPIOs that have to be configured per motherboard, then you have to collect a lot of information about the platform. So that's the schematics for the motherboard. Here, for example, you see the, the DDR4 lines that go to the processor on this specific model. And in order to get anywhere, we're going to have to figure out how those lines are connected and pass that to the memory reference code, which initializes memory. So if Coreboot supports the SOC, that's great. 
Uh, right now, Coreboot has support for Ice Lake and Cascade Lake, and uh, that provides support for all the latest platforms. Tiger Lake is probably coming soon, which will be the next platform we're targeting. Uh, the good news is things have changed quite a bit since a few years ago. A few years ago, the FSP was six months behind. A few years ago, the, the, it felt like core boot support for, for platforms was much later after release. Now we have support for platforms prior to release. So now that we have that, we try to get memory init to work. Currently, the FSPM provides memory init on this model. Uh, that's a closed source binary from Intel. It's actually source available. If you're a partner, you can ask for source code. Uh, you're not allowed to distribute it. It has a very restrictive license. You use that to, um, you use the settings for like uh, the resistors that are connected to the memory bus, the way that the, that the bytes are mapped to get the system to initialize memory. And you have to do that to get to graphics init, and you have to do that to get more advanced debugging out of the board. So there is actually a method in core boot to debug and in min platform using this, where you can dump debug output straight to the spy ROM, but it's not very versatile. So we like to get past that and get to a place where we can load uh, PCI Express devices and things like that. So that's the FSPS configuration. You have to prepare GPIO settings. Every board is going to have different GPIO settings. As Ron mentioned, sometimes they switch those settings in a board's lifetime. Uh, we don't have that from our, our board manufacturer, but uh, I can certainly see that happening. If you get the FSP configuration right, which is things like the video BIOS table that sets up the internal display on a laptop, things like the PCI Express lanes, how they're bifurcated, what devices they're connected to, and things like PCH devices, then you should be able to boot to an OS. Now, this is going to be very limited hardware support. Uh, you're going to have, hopefully, you're going to have drives because those are industry standard, but you're probably not going to have things like your, your power adapter working, your battery. You're not going to have your hotkeys working. So, this provides at best an IoT experience. So the next thing you have to do is define your ACPI tables. A lot of those are industry standard, uh, like batteries. If you define the right device in ACPI land, it shows up in every ACPI compliant operating system. Uh, but things like hotkeys are not. So you also have to develop drivers in the OS for that. Now, there's an interesting thing supporting these with a not vendor specific, with an industry standard driver called Intel HID Event Filter. But it's not very inclusive. There are a lot of hotkeys that are missed. So what we've actually been working on with our ACPI tables is to have something that's available to everyone who, who has these hotkeys, who's developing for a laptop, so they can use the same ACPI definitions over and over and over, and they can get to the point where the same driver in the operating system in Linux or whatever supports that device, and they don't have to keep adding in new definitions for every new device. Because what often happens for these is a device vendor has to add in the DMI information for every single device they ever develop to a long list in the Linux kernel that ends up being longer than the driver itself to identify how to access the hotkeys. So I went through that really fast because that's the part that we're going to handle. And we get to, we get to the point where all we have to do for a new product is identify the new GPIO settings for that product. We have the schematics. We can do the memory in it very quickly. It can take a day to get something booting on a new product this way. Then we work to add advanced features. So we developed Rust capabilities to uh, Rust libraries that work in UEFI. And those libraries allow native graphics support, high definition, and high quality font rendering. And we use those to build our firmware setup screen and our firmware updater. And they're meant to be features that can be used by anyone else. They're all GPL3 or, or MIT, depending on the project. And they're meant to be used by any vendor who wants to have high quality firmware. So after we've done that, Carl can describe what, what you can do. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So, um, so this work has been bringing up um, the, our first product, being the Darta Pro, uh, with open firmware. Um, uh, we expect to have it available in, in Q4 of this year, or generally available. And um, that should have a, a, a side note saying, 
hopefully Q4. Uh, the reason being is that we don't want to just uh, ship open firmware that has equivalent functionality to the proprietary firmware that we're replacing. We want a product that once we replace that, that proprietary firmware, you can feel the difference in the quality of the product. So it's going to boot far faster. It's going to spin will be more reliable. All the things that you think of that, uh, uh, that are annoyances caused by firmware, we want to, we want to as best we can, wipe those out so that, so that the customer can feel the difference when we've moved to open firmware. We want to be, we want to show, be the gold standard for a product with open firmware. Um, so uh, a, a byproduct of that and us shipping uh, the Darter Pro with open firmware means that all the things that Jeremy just described of memory initialization and, and um, uh, all the other functionality isn't required if you want to hack on firmware. So if you have a Darter Pro with the open firmware, then all you have to do is download the uh, Git repository, um, make changes that you'd like, uh, see and understand how the firmware operates, uh, and then reload it to your reload to your machine. So a lot of the, the, diff the lower level difficult things of just booting a machine are, are out of the way, and you can just get to, get to hacking. Um, you will brick machines, though. <laughs> It just happens. It's a natural part of BIOS development. So, um, so you'd want to have one of these if you're doing that that development. Um, however, uh, what we will um, what we'd like to do is for people that are doing firmware development on the Darter Pro, uh, we will test the firmware for you. So, if you um, uh, if you build something you don't have uh, the the spy ROM um, uh, set up, then you can send us a firmware. We'll make sure it boots for you, and then we can say, yeah, you're, you're going to be safe to go ahead and flash this. Uh, that doesn't scale very widely, but it's something that we want to start now, and our, my QC team is going to hate me. I don't think I've even told them. <laughs> so, so, But uh, we think that that's an important part to kind of get this momentum moving and, and get open firmware and get more people hacking on it and so you can feel more confident about about just experimenting with things and that you're not going to throw away a thousand dollar machine. Um, if you want to help, okay, so uh, hackable computers, hackable operating systems, hackable things are the basis of our ethos. It's who we are and it's what we care about. Um, so how do we build a, a secure system for hackable firmware? Uh, you can't have boot guard, obviously. Uh, we don't want to lock down our devices in a way that people can't do things with them. So we have some ideas about making uh, security, um, uh, making good security in hackable firmware. Jeremy can kind of discuss that. Yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. boot guard is a problem because you either leak the vendor key so that other people can compile firmware that boots, or you sign other people's firmware, which is in essence the same exact thing because now you've signed someone else's firmware, it looks like it came from you. So what we want to do is instead of using boot guard, we want to use, we're going to use update capsule in this new firmware. We're going to, when the capsule comes in, it will be checked against its signature. But if there's a mismatch, we're going to simply prompt the user to input a random number when the firmware doesn't match the vendor code. When they do that and they press enter, it will flash the new firmware, and if they've built the firmware with their own key as part of the BIOS, they can keep reflashing on their own firmware track as much as they like and have, have some level of proof that someone else hasn't flashed firmware that isn't signed with their own key. Doing this, the only way to get bad firmware or, or malicious firmware is to use one of these devices and physically open the machine. There will be no software update mechanism that can go through that process. Now, of course, with this, you can actually simply remove that security feature if you want, flash that firmware without the security feature, and now you have it open up however you want. By doing this, you don't have to ask the vendor for signing your firmware, and you, anybody can make their own firmware, but you can also be sure that someone hasn't flashed firmware without your consent. Right. But that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one, one idea, but we're also very interested in, in discussing with this community different ways to secure hackable firmware. And so if this is something that's interesting, interesting to you, please come up and, and let's have some conversations about it. Um, we talked about Min Platform and how its, its core purpose is only to bring up the hardware. That means advanced features are any other th anything else on top of that. A BIOS screen is an advanced feature. So that's something we've already implemented and implemented in a way that's reusable by people. Um, Pixie booting is an advanced feature. So that's, uh, uh, that would be a module that's added to Min Platform, and, um, and hence it's not there yet. Um, 
Let's see, uh, we do some things, we make some guesses about the configuration, like the CPU power levels. So CPU power levels are determined on different things like the thermal capabilities of the chassis that they, the processor and the chipset are, are, are housed in. Uh, we're using the, the power levels that are coming from the proprietary firmware and just copying those, but we don't know how optimized those really are. So if there's expertise in the room about optimizing CPU power levels in chassis, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. Um, Improvement, improvements for the build process is uh, Jeremy's domain. Yeah, currently we have several blobs that unfortunately have to be included in the firmware. We have the Intel microcode, which without actually having the microcode, sometimes the FSP can't even run because you haven't loaded new enough microcode. So we have the microcode, which we get from Intel through a private microcode repository. We have the FSP, which we have source available, but we're not allowed to share, unfortunately. And we have the ME, which no one even at Intel really knows anything about, uh, <laughs> which is scary. But uh, we, we hope, fingers crossed, that setting the hat bit and removing a whole bunch of code from the, from the ME actually does what it's supposed to do. And it doesn't have like a secret ROM chip where it stores its super backdoor program. Um, but keeping that up today is important, because if there is a vulnerability in, in, the, in the BUP in the ME, which is the piece that runs to bootstrap the processor and has to run in order for the processor to boot. Uh, if there is a vulnerability there and it's fixed by Intel, we have to quickly and very quickly get it into our firmware. So currently that's a pretty manual process. You have to extract the settings because the ME is actually transformed for every motherboard. You have to extract the settings uh, using a proprietary Intel tool and then apply those settings to the new ME and then do QC on it and having that process of getting a new GOP, getting a new ME, and getting a new FSP be, and, and microcode as, be as quick as possible is something we still haven't figured out. It's still a very manual process. All right. All right. And we, we're talking a bit about blobs here and the, uh, the fact that they exist. I'm still extremely optimistic about the path that I've seen over the last 14 years. They've become smaller and smaller and smaller. And now that uh, Intel is, is involved in developing open firmware, so I hope that they see the light for these other things like the ME and other areas. So uh, I'm only optimistic about what's, uh, what's possible and all, all these things becoming more open. Um, OK, so where we're working. Um, if you want to. This is the master repo. It has Git submodules for every other related repository. Uh, everything we're going to list after this is here. We're going to we're going to come back to this slide so I'm going to quickly go through the list of the other projects and then come back to here. If you want to look at any web page or anything, this is where you should go first. So, System76 has developed quite a number of things for this open firmware. We've developed our firmware setup menu, our firmware updater, we have a GOP policy driver which provides some board specific information to the Intel GOP driver. Uh, which is the UEFI driver for the graphics. We have an embed controller library that allows open source flashing of the embed controller. We have a spy library that allows, and these are Rust libraries, by the way. Every single one of the things listed here, except the top thing that is simply a meta repo, is written in Rust. So just so you know. Uh, we have a, a spy chip library, so you can flash the ROM. And we have an EC emulator, which I'm particularly proud of because of how ridiculous it was to set up. As you've seen, the documentation for the EC is completely confidential. Not only is it confidential, it's super messy and nasty to read. So in order to reverse engineer some of the things the embed controller does, I, I decided you know, I'm getting really tired of not being able to inspect the communication, and I'm not going to be able to like cut the LPC lines on the motherboard and splice into them. So what I did was I, I wrote an emulator for the embedded controller, and then I took KMU, which is an emulator, and I, I wrote a little driver that sockets over to the simulator of the EC, and it sends all the LPC traffic from the emulated version of the firmware over to the, to the emulator of the embed controller, which is using an 8051 processor and then has a bunch of other nasty, stupid vendor-specific stuff for like fan control and stuff. And then I can see the protocol that, that the proprietary firmware uses, and I can reverse engineer it, and I can develop our own stuff. Now, a lot of this work has been done 
under my alter ego as well. Uh, I, I am the maintainer and BDFL of Redox OS, which is a, a Rust uh, operating system. We, we have a microkernel. All of the drivers are written in user space and in Rust. Uh, and what, what I wanted for Redox was very similar to what we wanted at System76. We wanted UEFI and Rust to work together flawlessly. We wanted Coreboot and Rust to work together flawlessly. So I wrote a library for accessing the Coreboot file system. I wrote a library for parsing the Coreboot table, DMI tables, uh, Intel firmware images. Then there's a Rust UEFI library for defining all of the UEFI standard and a Rust UEFI standard library for providing what is essentially the Rust standard library in a, for a UEFI target. Uh, and then there's third parties. And these are some of the more important things because without this, we have really nothing. Coreboot, of course, we're using Coreboot for, for platform init for this, for this device. Uh, we have a fork where we maintain our latest mainboard stuff. We still need to clean up the mainboard and get it upstream. Uh, that is a process of, by the time we figure out a couple more bugs, we're going to submit this upstream and start using the upstream repo as the definition for where to get the core root piece of this. Then we have EDK2, which is the, the UEFI libraries um, and UEFI drivers. So our payload for core boot is currently EDK2. We have the Intel FSP, which is important for, for core boot to init um, on, on this platform. And then something that we'll get more into later uh, down the line is min platform. So as we work in tangent with Intel, we're developing this EDK2 platforms repo where min platform, uh, their platform init for UEFI, their open source platform init, which, which is really cool. They want the standard for UEFI BIOS to be open source. And this will hopefully, hopefully upend the UEFI market. I'm, I'm not entirely optimistic yet, because I don't see inside or AMI going anywhere, even though the stuff they create is terrible and never works. <laughs> uh, but they do have a, quite a big hold on the industry. But at the very least, we hope that they'll be using Min Platform as the platform in it, and that a big portion of the stuff required to bring up an Intel motherboard will be open source and, and by default. Uh, yeah, and I'll take you back to the main repo so you can take pictures or write it down or yep. whatever. And uh, we spoke quickly. <laughs> so there's a lot of time left. We hope you guys have questions. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can go to the microphones, to the stand-up microphones, and uh, have them so we have all questions recorded. How big is the, oh. How big is the flash part on the motherboard? 16 meg. On this model. Ouch. <laughs> hey, 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 hey! No, 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 no. It can be a lot bigger, boy. <laughs> I'm thinking about I'm thinking about gigabyte flashes when we do our own when we do our own board. Yeah. So the microphones are not biting. Really, I checked. So is this the superset of the core boot? At the moment, yes. It is uh, Coreboot is the platform in it, and the bootloader for the payload that is UEFI. So how you see the direction of Coreboot and firmware open going together, or like what? Well, min platform would replace Coreboot. And what, what I see personally is uh, I'm really excited by Coreboot. I really like Coreboot. So even if we're not maintaining it as, as our System76 default firmware, I would like to maintain core boot support going forward so that all the payloads available in core boot, Linux and uh, Redox is actually a payload for, for core boot right now. Uh, not in the upstream, but we can talk about that later. Um, and CBIOS. Last thing, as you mentioned that uh, you are using the user space driver, any reason for that not being in the kernel? Redox is a microkernel. That's, that's why. It's not related to this. So. We're not doing we're not doing user space in firmware. Uh, I don't think that makes sense. Firmware should really only be initialization, yeah. not runtime components. So it starts something that runs in in uh, ring zero, and then ring zero starts up ring three. Uh, awesome stuff. The set of things that you're trying to have open is this only 
stuff that runs on the main CPU for platform init, or also the embedded controller firmware that that's so at one time. With the extremely high quality, and I say high quality because I wrote it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> embedded <laughs> controller simulator, my my and we're also you know, this is easy peasy, lemon squeezy, okay? Flashing an embedded controller using ISP, it actually connects through the keyboard matrix and then connects to like three other chips that are all <laughs> proprietary, who knows what they use. And then there's a Windows piece of software so that you can flash the embedded controller. When we do our own motherboard, we are gonna use something that you can flash more easily. And hopefully the, the EC firmware will be on the Spyrom. So it's a lot more difficult to experiment with the EC firmware, but because we have this simulator and because we're going to have the ability to flash the embedded controller using in-system programming, I do expect to uh, to try to re to create open source EC firmware. Yeah. So this this is a good follow up because I wanted to ask about what you plan to do when you switch from using the ODM model to designing your own board. Hopefully, mm -hmm. one of those things is like USB three DCI debugging. But what what other things are you what like what's going to motivate you to really change over to your own board? What improvements can you make? Yeah, the the main motivation it's it's going to be done in KiCad hopefully, and it's going to be a GPL three design. So that's the main motivation. Uh, a design that we own that's open source yeah, I should, and um, open hardware. To expand on that just a bit, we've been working on shipping away open source, not just in the operating system, but on the hardware side as well. So we've recently designed our own um, in-house desktop computer as well as I.O. controllers. And that all of that work is open source. So it's open hardware and open software together. And open firmware on the, on the right. I.O. controller. And open firmware. Uh, this is uh, extending that effort so that the more of the stack from the hardware all the way up is open source. Thanks. We got for another question or is it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I noticed sort of a slightly difference. In, it occurred to me. It, Difference in philosophy um, with your hold on, with your um, the things you're doing. So what we're doing kind of in Linux to, and I maybe arguably in the Chrome core boot is with depth charge. You, well, no, forget about depth charge. But we tend to move a lot of these sort of dialogue type things off into the domain of Linux. In other words, you want to minimize the number of things you're running in Ring Zero. You know, in, yeah, sure. In the firmware. But if I read what you were saying right, it's sort of you're 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 growing that number of things, but in a safe language. I was just kind of curious about your thoughts about the two approaches. Yeah, that's a good point. We could we could uh, remove more and more and more from the firmware, and we could have. Why are we doing anything in UEFI? That's <laughs> why not do it in Linux. Um, part of it is UEFI is the standard that gets us to booting every operating system. And Linux boot is really great. Linux, using Linux as the firmware so that you can k-exec another Linux is probably the fastest, most reliable way to get up to a Linux user space. Uh, it's just not something that boots absolutely everything, unless uroot provides an EFI implementation. So does that make sense? Yeah, we're booting Windows, though. Yeah. No, that's a good point. You're booting Windows how? With an EFI implementation? In Linux. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So maybe that's something we investigate. Uh, that's that's the reason we have an EFI implementation. It comes by default with with Tianacore. It has a, a setup menu that's blue and ugly and always at 800 by 600 or worse, uh, which then the the independent BIOS vendors take that and make it even uglier. And I don't know a single product that has absolutely you know. FF0000 as their dominant color because all the BIOSes seem to think that is the case because they use this ugly gray for all of the menus and this ugly blue and they don't make they don't really work at all. Uh, so it's poor taste. So all we've done with the firmware set menu <laughs> is uh, all we've done is make it high DPI capable, which the, the the interface is not by default. Make it always native resolution. Make it extremely high quality font rendering, and uh, show the default Tianocore menu. And themable. And themable, so, yeah. Since six, we have a brand, we have a style. It, it's going to represent our brand and style. But um, anyone else that picks it up and changes out the color palettes will represent their brand and style as well. Yes. Cool. So kind of slightly off topic, I was just curious. Uh, 
I realized no one ever does any laptop or desktop stuff under the open compute banner. Would that be something you're interested in or just stay with GPL3 and, and go it your own way? Uh, so Min Platform is BSD licensed. I don't know if that's compatible with you. Uh, and then EDK2 is, is similar, BSD licensed. So we, we right now, core boot is GPL3. It boots a payload that is, that is BSD. I'm specifically thinking the hardware, the open yeah. computer. Oh, they, uh, yeah, what we've, um, we've latched on to Oshawa, the Open Source Hardware Association. Uh, we believe they have a lot of good momentum, and it's a, it's a nice community to work within. Um, but we're, we're also open to, to you know, all open communities, so we'd look at it. Cool. Hi. I just have a curiosity about uh, using the core boot. Is there any plan to use a uh, U-boot on top of... Uh, EFI or uh, U-Boot alone? Not at the moment. Uh, on x86, the last time I tried U-Boot, it was, was not a good experience. Okay. So x86 will probably support an U-Boot, will probably build quickly. But um, right now, EFI allowed us to boot all of the operating systems that we need to provide support for. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>